Chapter Nineteen of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I slept all that night in a deep, unbroken slumber, waking with the first glimpse of morning, calm and refreshed, but very sleepily perplexed at my surroundings. It was only after long cogitations that the thread of my coming hither took form and shape when at last i had examined myself in my antecedents and reduced them to the melancholy present i got up and looked from the window a fair tract of country lay outside deep wooded and undulating with pastoral meadows in between the hangers and beyond in the open that streamlet whose prattle had been heard the night before lay spread into a broad rushy tarn overgrown with green weeds and water things and then running on through the flat soft meadows of the hollow where the house was built wound into the far distance where it joined something that shone in the low white light like the gleam of a broader river it was not a cheerful morning for it had rained much and the chilly mist hung low and still about these sombre wooded thickets and the long grass between them the sleepy rooks in the nests upon the bare tree-tops were later to wing than usual cawing melancholy from the sodden boughs as though loath to leave them and down below nothing sang or moved but the dark black merle fluttering along the covert side and the mavis turning a plaintive and uncertain note from off the wet fir tops when i had stared my full and learnt little from the outlook i donned those clothes that i had borrowed and they were a happy choice they fitted me like a lady's glove and as i laced and hooked and belted them before a yellow mirror let into the black panel of my chamber door i could not but feel that they looked a goodly fashion for one of my make and build i had not seemed so stalwart and so sleek so straight in limb and broad in shoulder since i was a saxon thane then i belted on that pretty sword round my nicely tapering middle and ran my fingers through my black eastern locks arranging them trimly inside my high-standing frill and took another look or two into the glass and then with a derisive smile a little scornful at the secret pleasure those fine feathers gave me i went forth surely never did mortal mason build such a house before the deepest densest forest path that ever my hunter's foot had trodden was simple to those mazes of curly stairs and dim passages and wooden alleys that led by tedious ways to nothing and creaking rotten steps that beguiled the wanderer by sinuous repetitions from desolate wing to wing and flight to flight and all the time that i wrestled with those labyrinthine mazes in the struggle to reach latitudes i knew not a sign could i see of my host nor a whisper could i catch of human voice or familiar sound in that dusty desolate wilderness such an impenetrable stagnation hung over that empty habitation that the crow of a distant cock or the yelp of a village cur would have been a blessed interruption but neither broke the vault-like solemn stillness from room to room i went opening countless doors at random all leading into spacious mouldy chambers bare and tenantless feeling my way by damp neglected wall and dangerous broken floorings to endless cobwebbed windows unbarring wooden casements and letting in the watery light that only made the inner desolation more ghostly conspicuous but nothing human could i find nor any prospect but that same one i had seen before of damp woodlands and marshy water meadows out beyond perhaps for half an hour had i adventured thus hopelessly lost in the dusty bowels of that stupendous building and then just as i was near despairing of an exit and meditating a leap from a casement on to the stony terraces below opening one final door that might well have been but a household cupboard for the storing of linen and raiment there at my feet was the great main staircase leading by many a turn and staging to the central hall below i put with the point of my sword a cross upon the outside of that cupboard door so that i might know it again if need be and then descended 
had you seen me coming down those tudor steps in that tudor finery my hand upon the hilt of my long steel rapier perked behind me my great ruffle and my curled moustache my strong soldier limbs squeezed into those sweet-fitting satin hose and sleeves so stern and grim so lonely and silent in the white glimmer of the morning shine that came from distant lattice and painted oriel you well might have thought me scarcely flesh and blood some old tudor ancestor of that old tudor hall stepped from a painter's canvas just as he was in life and come with beatless feet to see what cheer his gross descendants made of it where he had once lived so noisy and so jolly down the steps i came and into the banquet hall empty and deserted like all else and so sauntered to the table-head where i had supped the evening before not one trace of human kind had i seen since the night and yet that little thing quite startled me the supper had been cleared away another napkin spread another plate put out with fruit and bread and a large beaker of good new milk stood by to flank them i stared hard at that simple seeming meal and could not comprehend it i was near sure the old man had not set it yet if he had why was there but one plate one place one chair one beaker was it meant for me or him what fingers had pulled that fruit or drawn that milk still warm from its source i would wait i thought and strolled off to the windows and down them all slowly in turn then back again to idly hum a favourite tune we had sung yesterday at crecy but still nothing came or stirred then i went into the hall and examined that trophy of weapons and tried them all and then unbarred the great door and went out upon the terrace there to dangle my satin legs over the balustrades during a long interval of gloomy speculation but not a leaf was moving not a sign or whisper could i see of that strange old fellow who had brought me hitherto and now did his duty by his guest so quaintly at last i went back to the dining place and regarded that mysterious meal with fixed attention now this i thought is surely spread for me and if it is not then it should be the master of a house may get him food how and when he likes but the guest share is put ready to his hand i have waited a long hour and more the sun is high surely that learned pedant could not mean to belay his courtesy by starving a stranger visitor no it was certainly affectation to wait longer at the worst there must be more where these good things came from and being hungry and having thus appeased my conscience i clapped my sword upon the table and fell to work and in a short space had made a light though sufficient meal and cleared everything eatable completely from the table i was the better for it yet this strange solitude began to weigh upon me but a few hours since surely it was no more i had been in a busy camp bright with all the panoply of war active bustling and here why the white mist seemed creeping through me it was so damp and melancholy the tawny mildew of these walls seemed settling down upon my spirit jove i felt by comparison of what i had been and was already touched with the clammy rottenness of this place and slowly turning into a piece of crumbling lumber such as lay about on every hand a tarnished faded monument to a life that was bygone oh i could not stand the house and taking my cap and sword strolled down to the garden full of pensive thoughts morose uncaring and so out into the woods beyond and over hill and dale a long walk that set the stagnant blood flowing in my sleepy veins and did me tonic good leaving the hall where so strange a night had been spent i strode out strongly over hill and dale for mile after mile without a thought of where the path might lead i stalked on all day and came back in the evening yet the only thing worthy of note upon that round was a familiarness of scene a certain feeling of old acquaintance with plain and valley which possessed me when i had gone to the farthest limit of the walk at one hilltop i stopped and looked over a wide gently swelling plain of verdure with a grassy knoll or two in sight 
and woods and new wheat fields shining emerald in the april sunlight while far away the long clouds were lying steady over the dim shine of a distant sea i thought to myself surely i have seen all this before yonder knoll standing tall among the lesser ones why does it appeal so to me and that distant flash of water there among the misty woodlands a few miles to westward of it jove i could somehow have sworn there had been a river there even before i saw the shine some sense within me knows each swell and hollow of this fair country here and yet i know it not they were not my saxon glades that spread out beneath me and the distant stream swept round no such steep as that castled mount wherefrom i had set out for cressy i could not justify that spark of vague remembrance and long i sat and wondered how or when in a wide life i had seen that valley but fruitlessly yet fancy did not err though it was not for many days i knew it then after a time i turned homewards homeward was it well it was as much thitherward as any way i knew though indeed i marvelled as i went why my feet should turn so naturally back to that gloomy mansion peopled only by shadows and the smell of sad suggestions perhaps my mind just then was too inert to seek new roads and accepted the easiest after the manner of weak things as the inevitable be this as it may i went back that wet misty afternoon alone with my melancholy listlessness through the damp dripping woods and coppices where the dead ferns looked red as blood in the evening glow i was so heedless i lost my way once or twice and when at length the dead front of the old house glimmered out of the mist ahead the early night was setting in and that lank dejected garden those ruined terraces and hundred staring empty windows frowning down on the grave green courtyard stones seemed more forsaken more mournful looking even than it had the night before i found the front door ajar exactly as it was left and groping about presently discovered the tinder and steel i made a light and laughed a little bitterly to think how much indeed i was at home then in bravado and mockery unsheathed my sword and went from room to room in the gathering dusk stalking sullen and watchful with the gleam of light held above my head down each clammy corridor and vault-like chamber wrapped with my hilt on casement and panels and listening to the gloomy echo that rumbled down the ghoulish palace i pricked with my rapier point each swelling rotten curtain i punctured every ghostly swinging arras and stabbed the black shadows in a score of dim recesses but nothing i found until in one of these my sword point struck something soft and yielding and sank in jove it startled me twas wondrous like a true good stab through flesh and bone and my fingers tightened upon the pummel and i sent the blade home through that yielding unseen something and a span deep into the rotten wall beyond then looked to see what i had got for twas but a woman's dress left on a rusty nail a splendid raiment once such as a noble girl might wear and a princess give padded and quilted wondrously with yards of stitching down the front wherefrom rude hands had torn gold filigree and pearl embroideries and where the wearer's heart had beat those rough fingers had left a faded rose still tied there by a love-knot on a strand of amber silk a lovely gown once on a time no doubt but now my sword had run it through and through from back to bosom lord how it smelt of dead rose and must and moth i shook it angrily from my weapon and left it there upon the rotten boards and went on with my quest but neither high nor low nor far nor near was there to be found the smallest trace of my host or any living mortal at last weary and wet and oppressed with those vast echoing solitudes i went back to the great hall passed all the untouched litter i had made in the morning and so to the banquet place i walked up the long black table set solemn with double rows of empty chairs and lit the lamp that stood at top 
it burnt up brightly in a minute and there beneath i saw the morning meal had been removed the supper napkin neatly laid and bread wine and cheese laid out afresh for one so unexpected was that neat array so quaint so out of keeping with the desolate mansion that i laughed aloud then paused for down in the great vaulty interior of that house the echo took my laughter up and the lone merriment sounded wicked and infernal in those soulless corridors well there was supper while i was tired and hungry i would not be balked of it though all hell were laughing outside in the vast empty grate i made a merry fire with some old broken chairs a jolly roaring blaze that curled about the mighty iron dogs as though glad to warm the chilly hearth again and went flaming and twisting up the spacious chimney in right gallant kind then i lifted the stopper of the wine-jar and finding it full of a good reenish vintage set to work to mull it i fetched a steel gorget from the trophy in the hall poured the liquor therein and put it by the blaze to warm and to make the drink the more complete i spit an apple on my rapier point and toasted the pippin by the embers thus making a wassail bowl of most superior sort i ate and drank and supped very pleasantly that evening while the strong wind whistled among the chimney stacks and rattled with unearthly persistence upon the casements or opened and shut now soft now fiercely a score of creaking distant doors the spluttering rain came down upon the fire by which i sat in my quaint finery warming my tudor legs by that tudor blaze the tall spectral things of the garden beyond the curtainless windows nodded and bent before the storm loose strands of ivy beat gently upon the panes like the wet long fingers of ghostly vagrants imploring admission the water fell with measured beat upon the empty courtyard stones from broken gargoyle and spout like the fall of gently pattering feet and the strangest sobbing noises came from the hollow wainscoting of that strange old dwelling-place but do you think i feared i who had lived so long and known so much i who four times had seen the substantial world dissolve into nothing and had awoke to find a new earth born from the dusty ashes of the past i who had stalked four times the void air with all i loved i for whom the shadowy fields of the unknown were so thickly habited i to whom the teeming material world again was so unpeopled so visionary and desolate i mocked the wild gossip of the storm and grimly wove the infernal whispers of that place into the thread of my fancies hour by hour i sat and thought thought of all the rosy pictures of the past of all the bright beams of love i had seen shine for me in maiden eyes all the wild glitter and delight of twenty fiery combats all the joy and success all the sorrow and pleasure of my wondrous life and thus thought and thought until i wore out even the storm that went sighing away over the distant woodlands and the fire that died down to a handful of white ashes and the wine-pot that ran dry and empty with the last flames in the grate and then i took my sword and the taper and leaving the care of to-morrow to the coming sunrise went up the solemn staircase and threw myself upon the first dim couch in the first black chamber that i met with i threw myself upon a bed dressed as i was but could not sleep as soon as i wished indeed a heavy drowsiness possessed me and now i would dream for a minute or two and then start up and listen as some distant door was opened or to the quaint gusts that roamed about those corridors and seemed now and then to hold whispered conclave outside my door it was like a child i knew to be so restless but yet he who lives near to the unknown grows by nature watchful it did not seem possible i had fathomed all the mystery there was in that gloomy mansion and so i dozed and waked and wondered waiting in spite of myself for something more all in the deep shadow of my rotten bed hangings now speculating upon my host 
and why he tenanted such a life-forsaken cavern and ate and drank from ancient crockery and had store of mouldy finery and rusty weapons and then idly guessing who had last slept on this creaking sombre bed and why the pillows smelt so much of mouldiness and mildew or again listening to the wail of the expiring wind among the chimneys overhead and the dismal sodden drip of water falling somewhere perhaps i had amused myself like that an hour and it was as near as might be midnight the low white moon was just a glimpse over the sighing tree-tops in the wilderness outside i had been dozing lightly when on a sudden my soldier ear distinctly caught a footfall in the passage without and starting up on my elbow in the black shadow of the bed i gripped the hilt of the sword that lay along under the pillows and held my breath as slowly the door was opened wide and before my astounded eyes a tall dark figure entered it was all done so quietly that beyond the first footfall and the soft click of the lifting latch i do not think a sound broke the heavy stillness that between the two pauses of the wind reigned throughout the empty house very gently that dusky shadow by my portal shut the door behind and it might have been only the outer air that entered with him or something in that presence itself but a cold damp breath of air pervaded all the room as the latch fell back i did not fear and yet my heart set off a thumping against my ribs and my fingers tightened upon the fretted hilt of my toledo blade as that thing came slowly forward from the door and big and tall and so far indistinct stalked slowly to the bed foot touching the post like one who in an uncertain light reassures him by the feel of well-known landmarks and so went round towards the latticed window i did not stir but held my breath and stared hard at that black form that all unconscious of my presence slowly sauntered to the light and took form and shape in a minute it was by the lattice and to my stern wondering awe there in the pale white moonshine looking down into the desolate garden beyond with melancholy steadfastness was the figure of a tall black spanish gallant in that white radiance against the ebony setting of the room he was limbed with extraordinary clearness indeed he was a great silver column now of stenciled brightness against the black void beyond and i could see every point and detail in his dress and features as though it were broad daylight he was or must i say he had been a tall slim man long-jointed and sparse after the manner of his nation and to-night he wore something like the fashion of the time black hose and shoes a black seeming waistcoat a loose outdoor hood above it a slouch cap a white ruffle and a broad black leather belt with a dagger dangling from it so much was ordinary about him but jove his face in that uncertain twilight was frightful it was cadaverous beyond expression and tawny and mean and all the shadows on it were black and strong and out of that dreary parchment mask making its lifelessness the more deadly by their glitter shone two restless sunken eyes he kept those yellow orbs turned upon the garden and then presently put up a hand and began stroking his small pointed beard still seeming lost in thought and next stretching out a finger and hoth what a wicked-looking talon it did seem the shape began drawing signs upon the mistiness of the diamond panes at the same time he began to mutter and there was something quaintly gruesome about those disconnected syllables in the midnight stillness yet though i leaned forward and peered and listened nothing could i learn of what he wrote or said he fascinated me i forgot to speak or act and could only regard with dumb wonder that outlined figure in the moonlight and the long dead face so dreadfully ashine with life so bewitched was i that had that vision turned and spoken i should have made the best shift to answer that were possible 
there was some tie i felt between him and me more than showed upon the surface of this chance meeting of ours something which even as i write i feel is not yet quite explained though i and that shadow now know each other well but instead of speaking that presence man or spirit from the outer spaces left off his scratching on the window and with a shrug of his spanish shoulders and a malediction in guttural bisque turned from the window-cell and walked across the room as he did so i noticed what had been invisible before in his left hand a canvas bag and by the shape and weight of it that bag seemed full of money i watched him as he stalked across the room watched him disappear into the shadow and then listened with every sense alert to the click of the latch and the creak of the door as he left my chamber by the opposite side to that whereat he entered as those faint ghostly footsteps died away slowly down the corridor my native sense came back and in a trice i was on foot dressed as i had lain me down and snatching my sword and cloak in a fever of expectation i ran over to the window and looked upon the writing it was figures figures and sums in ancient moorish arabesque and the long sharp nail marks of that hideous midnight mathematician were still pencilled clearly on the moonlit dew my blood was now coursing finely in my veins and hot and eager to see some more of this grim stranger i strode across the room and stepped out into the passage at first it seemed that he had gone completely for all was so still and silent but the white light outside was throwing squares of silver brightness from many narrow windows on the dusty floor and there he was in a moment crossing the farthest patch tall and silvery in that radiance with his long slim black legs his great ruffle and flapping cloak looking most wicked i went forward making as little noise as might be and seeing my ghostly friend every now and then until when we had traversed perhaps half that deserted mansion i lost him where three ways divided and went plunging and tripping forward striving to be as silent as i could though why i know not and making instead at every false step a noise that should have startled even ghostly ears but i was now well off the trail and nothing showed or answered it was black as hell in the shadows and white as day where the moonbeams slanted in from the orioles and through this chilly chequer i went feeling on by damp old walls and worm-eaten wainscoting slipping down crumbling stairs that were as rotten as the banisters which went to dust beneath my touch opening sullen oaken doors and peering down the dreary wastes within listening prying wondering but nowhere could i find that shadowy form again i followed the chase for many minutes far into a lonely desert wing of the old house then paused irresolute what was i to do i had my cloak upon one hand and my naked rapier was in the other but no light or any means of making one the vision had gone and i found now that the chase had ended and my blood began to tread a sober measure it was dank chilly and dismal in these black draughty corridors worse still i had lost all count and reckoning of where my bed had been and though that was small matter in such a house yet somehow i felt it were well to reach the vantage ground of more familiar places wherein to wait the morning so as nearly as was possible i groped back upon my footsteps by tedious ways and empty chambers low in heart and angry now stopping to listen to the fitful moaning of the wind or the pattering rain-spots on the glass or some distant panels creaking in distant chambers half thinking that after all i had been a fool and cozened by some sleepy fancy and so i went back dejected and dispirited until presently i came to a gloomy arch in a long corridor tapestried across with heavy hangings unthinkingly i lifted them there as the curtains parted thirty paces off a bright moonlit doorway gently opened 
and into the light stepped that same black-browed foreigner again i did what any other would have done though it was not valiant stepped back against the niche and drew the tapestry folds about me and so hidden waited down he sauntered leisurely straight for my hiding-place and as he came there was full time to note every wrinkle and furrow on that sullen ashy face hoth he might have been a decent gentleman by daylight but in the nightshine he looked more like a weak dead corpse than aught else and with eyes glued to those twinkling eyes of his and abated breath and irresolute fingers hard set upon my pummel hilt i waited he came on without a pause or sign to show he knew that he was watched and as he crossed the last patch of light i saw the bag of gold was gone and the hand that had carried it was wrapped in a bloody handkerchief another minute and we were not a yard apart what good was valour there i thought what good were weapons or courage against the malignity of such an infernal shadow i held back while he passed and in a minute it was too late to stop him yet i could follow and half ashamed of that moment's weakness and with my courage budding up again i started from my hiding-place and brandishing my rapier my cloak curled on my other arm as though i went to meet some famous fencer i ran after the spaniard and now he heard me and with one swift look over his shoulder and a startled guttural cry set off down the passage from light to light he flashed and shadow to shadow i hot after him my courage rampant now again and all the bitterness and disappointment of the last few days nerving my heart until i felt i could exchange a thrust or two with the black arch fiend himself twas a brief chase at the bottom of the corridor stood a solid oak partition i had him safe enough i saw him come to that black barrier and hesitate whereon i shouted fiercely and leapt forward and in another minute i was there where he had been and the corridor was empty and the panelled partition was doorless and unmoved and not a sound broke the stillness of that old house save my own angry cry that the hollow echoes were bandying about from ghostly room to room and corridor to empty corridor End of chapter 19chapter 20 of the wonderful adventures of fra the phoenician by edwin lester arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain a bright dazzle of sunshine roused me with the following sunrise i rubbed my sleepy lids and sat up vaguely gazing round upon the tarnished hangings the immovable white faces of the pictures on the wall and the dusty floor whereon in the greyness of countless years was marked just the outlines of last night's feet and nothing more however it was truly a lovely morning and moved by that subtle tonic which comes with sunshine i felt brighter and more confident having dressed i went down the old staircase again to the breakfast which would certainly be ready unbarring as i passed the casements and setting wide the great hall door that the cool breath of that spring morning might sweep away the mustiness of the old house even humming a snatch of an old camp song learnt in picardy to myself the while thus i gained the dining hall in good spirits and saw as had been expected a new meal set with modest food and drink for me and me alone but no other sign or trace of human presence i sat and ate vowing as i did so this riddle had gone far enough unanswered and before that shiny sparkling world outside all tears and laughter like a young maid's face was a few hours older i would know who was my host who served me thus persistent and invisible and what might be the service i was looked to pay for such quaint entertainment therefore as soon as the meal was done i belted on my sword and straightened down my finery the which had lost its creases and sat extremely well and smoothing the thick mass of my black eastern hair under my velvet tudor cap 
sallied forth there was nothing new about the garden save the sunshine and having intently regarded the broad terraced and mullioned front of the house without learning one single atom more than i knew before i resolved to force a way round to the rear if it were possible but this was not so easy on one hand were thickets of shrub and bramble laced into dense impenetrable barriers and on the other great yew hedges in solemn ranks with vast masses of ivy and holly forbidding a passage but nothing daunted i walked down to those yews and peering about soon perceived a tangled pathway leading into their fastness it was a narrow little way begrudgingly left between those sullen hedges thick grown with dank weeds below and arched over by neglected growth so that the sun could not shine into these dusky alleys and the paths were wet and chilly still well i pushed on now to right and now to left amid the tangles of one of those old mazes that gardeners love to grow and until only the tall smokeless chimney-stacks of the deserted house shone red under the sunshine over the bough-tops in the distance and then i paused it was all so strangely quiet and so lonesome i had been solitary so long it seemed doubtful whether any one was alive in the world but me why surely i was thinking there were no human beings at least about this shadow-haunted spot it were idle to seek for them i would give it up and just as i was meditating that had half turned to go and yet was standing irresolute jove right from the air in front of me right out from the black bosom of the shadowy yew and ivies there burst a wild elfin strain of laughter a merry bubbling peal a ringing cascade of fairy merriment a sparkling avalanche of disembodied mirth that like some sweet essence permeated on an instant all that gloomy place and thrilled down the damp alleys and shook the thousand coloured drops of dew from bent and leaf and vibrated in the misty prismatic sunshine up above and then was gone leaving me rooted to the ground with the suddenness of it and half delighted and half amazed but only for a moment and then i leapt forward and saw a turning and found at bottom of it a gap and plunged headlong through it was a pretty scene i staggered into in front of me spread the open centre of the maze a grassy space some twenty paces all about and lying clear to the sunshine falling warm and strong upon it in the midst of that fair opening shut off from wind and outer barrenness had once been a fountain with a basin and though the jet played no longer yet the white marble pool below it stained golden and green with moss and weather held from brim to brim a little lake of sparkling water and about that fountain bright in decay the green ferns were unwinding while great clumps of gold narcissus hung trembling over their own reflection in the broken basin overhead there was a blossoming almond tree a cloud of pale pink buds where from a constant cheerful hum of bees came forth and a pale rain of petals fell on to the ground beneath and tinted it like a rosy snow no other way existed in and out of that delightful circle save where i had entered but little paths rang here and there among the grass and industrious love had marked them out with pretty country flowers pale primroses all damp and cool among the shadows broad bands of purple violets lining seductive alleys splendid star-like saffron outshining even the gorgeous sun and blushing daisies with varnished king-cups where the fountain ran to waste it was as pretty a dominion as sweet an oasis in that dank dark desert beyond as you could wish to see and the clear strong breath of flowers and the warm wine of the sunshine set my blood throbbing deep and swift to a new sense of love and pleasure as i stood there spellbound on the dewy threshold but fair as earth and sky looked in that magic circle they were not all kneeling at the broken marble fountain her dainty sleeves rolled to pearly elbows the strands of her loose brown hair dipping as she bent over the shining water with white muslin smock neatly bunched behind her a milky kerchief knotted across her bosom 
and a great country hat of straw by her side knelt a fair young english girl she did not see me at once her face was turned away and on her other hand she was tending a noble peacock a splendid fowl indeed as stately as though she were the suzerain of all heaven's chickens ivory white from bill to spurs crested with a coronet of living topaz and with a mighty fan upreared behind him of complete whiteness from quill to fringe saving the last outer row of gorgeous eyes that shone in gold and purple and amethyst refulgent in that spotless field a magnificent bird indeed and fully wotting of it and that kneeling maid was dipping water for him in her rosy palm and the great bird was perched upon the marble rim and dropping his ivory beak into that sweet chalice and lifting his lovely throttle and flashing coronet to the sky ever and anon while the thrill of the girl's light laughter echoed about the place and the almond blossoms showered down on them and the bees hummed and the sweet incense of the spring was drawn from the warm budding earth flowers glittered the sun shone and the sky was blue as i the intruder stood silent and surprised before that dainty picture in a moment the girl looked up and saw me in my amber suit and ruffle my rapier and cap standing there against the black framing of the maze and then she did as i had done stared and rubbed her eyes and stared again in a moment she seemed to understand i was something more than a fancy whereat with a little scream of fear she sprang to her feet and crossing the kerchief closer on her bosom pulled down her sleeves and backed off towards the almond tree but i had that comely apparition fairly at bay and after so many hours without company did not feel a mind to let her go too easily whether she proved fay or fairy nymph naiad or just plain country flesh and blood i pulled off my cap and with a sweeping bow advanced slowly towards her whereon she screamed again fair girl i said i grieve to interrupt so sweet a picture with my uninvited presence but wandering down these paths your laughter burst upon the stillness and drew me here and now sir quoth that fair material sprite recovering herself and with a pretty air you would ask the shortest way to the public road it lies there to your left beyond the holly bank you see over by the meadows why not exactly that i laughed i have an idle hour or two on my hand and since you seem to have the same i would rather rest content with the good fortune which brought me hither than try new paths for lesser pleasures if you would sit i think this grassy mound is broad enough for two i meant it well but the maid was timid and far from rescue in the wilderness of that maze the colour mounted to her cheeks until they were pinker than the almond buds overhead she looked this way and that and gave one fleeting glance round the strong close-set walls of that sunny garden among the yews then just one other glance at me that dangerous stranger in silk and satin standing so gallant cap in hand and finally she was away running like a hind towards the only outlet the gap by which i had come in but was i to be robbed of a pretty comrade so was the lovely elf of the neglected garden to slip between my fingers without answering one single question of the many i would ask i spun round on my heels and quick as that maiden's feet were on the turf mine were quicker we got to the gap together and in another minute her kirtle fluttering in the breeze her loose hair adrift and the flush of fear and exertion on her youthful face that comely lady was struggling in my grasp i held her just so long as she might recognise how strong her bonds were then set her free if she had been pink before that maid was now ruddier than the wind-flowers in the grass oh fie sir she began as soon as she could get her breath oh fie and for shame you wear the raiment of a gentleman you carry courtly arms you do not look at least a rough uncivil rogue and yet you burst into a privy garden and frighten offend a harmless girl oh for shame sir if gentleness and courtesy are so poor barriers we shall need to look the better to our hedges let me by sir and gathering her skirts in her hand 
and tossing back her head with all the haughtiness she could command that damsel looked me boldly in the eyes fair foolish girl she thought to stare me down i who had eyed unmoved a thousand sights of dread and wonder i who had mocked the stare of cruel tyrants and faced unblanching the worst that heaven or hell could work what was i to be out of countenance under the feeble battery of such gentle orbs as those twas boldly conceived but it would not do and in a moment she felt it and her eyes fell from mine the colour rushed again from brow to chin she let her flowered skirt fall from her grip she turned away for a moment and there and then burst out a crying behind her hands as though the world were quite inside out now to stand the fair open assault of her eyes was one thing but such sap as this was more than my resolution could abide you do mistake me maid indeed i cried i swear there is no deed of courtesy or good will in all the world i would not do for you why then sir do the least and easiest of all stand from that gap and let me pass if you insist upon it even that i must submit to there there is your way free and unhampered and i stood back and left the passage clear and yet before you go fair lady let me crave of your courtesy one question or two such as civility might ask and courtesy very reasonably answer now that maid had dried her tears been stealing some sundry glances at me under the fringe of her wet lashes while we spoke and as a result she did not seem quite so wishful to be gone as she had been she eyed the free gap in the tall wall of yew and holly and then demurely me the pretty corners of her mouth began to unbend and while her fingers played among her ribbons and the colour came and went under her clear country skin feminine curiosity got the better of timidity and she hesitated oh she murmured if it were a civil question civilly asked i could wait for that what can i tell you first then are you of true material substance not vagrant and spiritual but as you certainly look a healthy plain plained mortal had i been else sir the damsel answered with a smile i had found a short way out of the trap you saw fit to hold me in that is true no doubt and i accept this initial answer with due thanks i had not asked it but lodging so long amid shadows sets my prejudice against the truth even of the sweetest substance and nextly sir nextly how came you in this lonely place with these pretty playthings about you how came you in my garden here where i thought nothing but silence and sadness grew your garden what hole in our outer fences gave you that warrant sir queried the young lady with a toss of her head how long user of trespass makes that right presumptive faith until you spoke i thought the garden was mine and my father's and the young lady for such i now acknowledge her to be looked extremely haughty what hast thou then a father yes sir is it so unusual with our kind that you should be surprised and who is thy father a very learned man indeed sir one who hath more wit in his little finger than another brave gentleman will have in all his body of nature so courteous that he instinctively would respect the privacy of a neighbour's property and manners so finished that he would never stay a maiden at her morning walk to bandy idle questions with her all out of vanity of black curled hair and a new mayhap unpaid for yellow suit if you had no more to ask me sir i think i would wish you good day but stay a minute it seems to me i might know thy father and this is the very point and centre of my inquisitiveness if you did it were much to your advantage but i doubt it he is recluse and grave and not given to chance companions or in fact to friend with any but some one or two ah that may well be so i said thoughtlessly speaking with small consideration and recalling the vision of my ancient host just as it came to me a sour wizened old carl clad in rusty green a straddle of a spavined ragged palfrey mean-seeming morose and sullen why maid is that thy father no sir gads i laughed it was discourteously spoken i should have said now i come to reflect more closely on it a reverent gentleman indeed white-bearded and sage with keen eyes shining severe 
the portals of a well-filled mind a carriage that bespoke good breeding and gentle blood raiment that disdained the pomp of silly fickle fashion and a general air of learning and of mildness my father sir to the very letter master adam faulkner the wisest man they say this side of the trent and greatly i know he would have me add at your service and you and mistress elizabeth faulkner daughter to that same and if indeed you know my father then as my father's friend i tender you my humble and respectful duty and the young lady half mockingly and half out of gay spirit picked up her flowered muslin skirt by two dainty fingers on either side and made me a long sweeping curtsey a pretty flower indeed for such a rugged stem but this is only half the matter fair girl i went on when my responding bow had been duly made if that venerable gentleman indeed be thy father and this his house and thine it is more strange than ever i came here two evenings since by his explicit invitation but since that time i have not set eyes upon him high and low have i hunted i have pricked arras and rapped on hollow panels trodden yon ghostly corridors at every hour of the day and night yet for all that time no sight or sound of host or hostess could i get now out of thy generous nature and the civility due to a wondering guest tell me how was this why sir do you mean to say since two nights past you have been lodged back there ah three days in yon grim mouldy mansion what there in that melancholy front of the many windows and all alone the very simple native truth alone in yonder tenement of faint sad odours and mournful sighing draughts alone save for a mind stocked with somewhat melancholy fancies mislaid by him it seemed who brought me thither dull solitary and damp why damsel and in faith when i had got so far as that the maiden sank back upon the grassy heap and hid her face behind her hands and gave way to a wild tumultuous fit of laughter a golden cascade of merriment that fell thick and sparkling from the sunny places of her youthful joyance as you see the heavy raindrops glint through a bright april sky a wild irresistible torrent of frolic glee that wandered round the far-off alleys and raised a hundred answering echoes of pleasure in that enchanted garden presently the maid recovered and putting down her hands asked and your meals how came you by them they were laid for me twice each day in the great hall by unseen hands most punctual and mysterious twas simple fare but sufficient to a soldier and each time i cleared the table and went afield when i came back it was reset yet no one could i see no sound there was to break the stillness again that lady burst into one of her merry trills and when it was over signed me to sit beside her i was not loath she was fair and young and tender as pretty an amaryllis as ever a country corridan did pipe to so down i sat now said she in primis sir i do confess we owe you recompense for such scant courtesy but i gather how it happened this is as i have said my father's house and mine and time was once it has been told me when he had near as many servants as i have flowers here with friends unending and all those blank windows yonder were full of lights by night and faces in the day then this garden was trim not only here but everywhere and great carriages ground upon the gravel drive and the courtyard was full of caparisoned palfreys that was all just so long ago sir that i remember nothing of it i can picture it damsel i said as she sighed and hesitated and how came this difference i do not know for certain i have often wondered why myself but my father presently had spent all his money and perhaps that somehow explained it sighed my fair philosopher then too he took studious and let his estate shift for itself while he pored over great tomes and learned things and hid himself away from light and pleasure that might have scared off those gay acquaintances might it not sir queried the lady so unlearned in worldly ways it were a good receipt indeed was my answer none better to grow poor and wise is high offence 
with such a guild and throng as you have mentioned so then the house emptied and the gates no longer stood wide open the garden was forsaken and grass grew on thy steps owls built in thy corridors a dismal picture and sad for thee but this does not explain the strange entertainment i have had where is your father lodged and you how is it we have not met before oh said the damsel brightening up again that is easily explained when his friends left him my father dismissed all his servants but one a spanish steward and good old mistress marjorie my nurse and saving my father my only friend then lodged himself back yonder in the far rear of our great house and there i have grown up like a fair flower in a neglected spot i hazarded ah and secure from the shallow tongues of silly flatterings old marjorie tells me now my father as you may have noted is at times somewhat visionary and absent it thus may well have happened that bringing you here a guest he would by old habit have taken you as he was so long accustomed to the great barren front and lodged you so once lodged there it is perfectly within his capacity to have utterly forgot your very existence but the meals for whom were they spread if not for me why simply for my father he has where he works a cupboard wherein is kept brown bread and wine and sometimes when studious studies keep him close he goes to it and will not look at better or more ordered meals then again when the fancy takes him he will have a place put for himself in the great deserted hall and sups there all alone now this has become his mood of late and i can only fancy that when you came the whim did change all on a sudden and thus you inherited each day that which was laid for him who too studious came not and old slow-witted marjorie finding every time the provender was gone laid and relaid with patient remembrance of her orders a very pretty coil indeed and i no doubt being sadly wandering afield all day just missed thy ancient servitor each time and had you ever come in upon her heels you would have seen her hobble up one silent corridor and down another and press a button on a panel and so pass through a doorway that you would never find alone from your tenement to ours oh it makes me laugh to think of you pent there i would have given a round dozen of my whitest hen's eggs to have been by to see how you did look that had been a contingency fair maid which had greatly lightened my captivity i answered and the lady went babbling on in the prettiest simplest way half rustic and half courtly in her tones as might be looked for in one brought up as she had been for an hour perhaps we lay and basked in the pleasant warmth while the rooms of melancholy and dampness were slowly drawn from me by the sun and that fair companionship then she rose and shaking a shower of almond petals from her apron re-knotted her kerchief and taking a look at the sky said it was past midday and time for dinner if i liked she would guide me to her father up i got and side by side with that fair elizabethan girl went sauntering through her flowery walks down past shrubberies and along the warm red old wall of her great empty house until we came into a quiet way overgrown with giant weeds and smelling sweet of green sheep's parsley and cool fair vegetable odours here the maid lifted a latch and led me through a well-hidden gateway into the sunny rearward courtyard it showed as different as could be from the dreary front the ground was cobblestones all neatly weeded round a square of close-cut grass on one side the great back wall of the manor-place towered windowless above us with red roofs mighty piles of smokeless chimney-stacks and corby steps far overhead and on the other hand at an angle to that wall were lesser buildings to left and right enclosing the grass-plot and shining in the sun warm latticed windowed quaint gabled the third side of the square was open and sloped down to fair meadows beyond which came flowering orchards bounded by a brook moreover there was life here plain homely honest country life the wild loose hanging roses and eglantine were swinging in the sunshine over the deep-seated porches of these modest places the lavender smoke was drifting among the budding branches overhead 
proud maternal hens were clucking to their broods about the open doorways there were blooming flowers growing by one deep-set window ah and fair mistress elizabeth's snowy linen was all out on cords across that pretty sunny courtyard struggling in sparkling white confusion against the loose caresses of the april wind and look you there cried pretty mistress faulkner when she saw it pointing far down the distant meadows tis there we keep our milk and cows oh as you are courteous as you would wish to deserve your gentle livery count those cattle for a minute and thereat while i obedient turned my back and mustered the distant beasts grazing knee-deep among the yellow buttercups she out flew upon those linens and pulled them down and rolled them up in swathes and set them on a bench then tucked back some dishevelled strands of hair behind her ears and somewhat out of breath turned to me again here she said on this side lives old marjorie and our steward black emmanuel marchena there on the other is my room that one with the flowers below and open lattices next is my father's below again is the room where we do eat and all that yonder those many windows alike above and those steps going down beneath the ground those half-hidden cobwebbed windows a blink with the level of the turf that is where my father works by all the saints fair girl i exclaimed impetuously as she led me towards that place thy father's workshop is on fire see the grey smoke curling from the lintel of the doorway and the broken panes and yonder i catch a glint of flame here let me burst the door and i sprang forward but the lady put her hand on my arm saying with a somewhat rueful smile no not so bad as that there is fire there but it is servant not master come in and you shall see she took me down six damp stone steps then lifted the latch of a massy weather-beaten oaken doorway and led me within it was a vast dim vaulted cellar the rough black roof of rugged masonry was hung by vistas of such mighty tapestries of grimy cobwebs as never mortal saw before on the near side the row of little windows dusty and neglected let in thin streams of light that only made the general darkness the more visible all the other wall was rough and bare beset with great spikes and nails wherefrom depended a thousand forms of ironware and ancient useless metal things the broken rusty implements of peace and war the floor seemed as i took in every detail of this subterranean chamber to be bare earth stamped hard and glossy with constant treading while here and there in hollows black water stood in pools and grey ashes from a furnace fire margined those miry places it was a gloomy hall without a doubt and as my eyes wandered round the shadows they presently discovered the presiding genius in the hollow of the great final arch was a cobweb smoke-grimed blacksmith's forge and bellows the little heap of fuel on it was glowing white and the curling smoke ascended part up the rugged chimney and part into the chamber on one side of this forge stood a heavy anvil and by it as we entered a man was toiling on a molten bar of iron plying his blows so slow and heavy it was melancholy to watch them that man it did not need another glance to tell me was my host if he had looked gaunt and wild by night the yellow flicker of the furnace and the pale mockery of daylight which stole through his poor panes did not improve him now the bright fire of enthusiasm still burnt in his keen old eyes i saw but they were red and heavy with long sleeplessness his ragged open shirt displayed his lean and hairy chest stained and smudged with the hue of toil his arms were bare to the elbow and his knotted old fingers clutched like the talons of a bird upon the handle of the hammer that he wielded grim old fellow he was near double with weariness and labour the breath came quick and hectic as he toiled the painful sweat cut white furrows down his pallid ash-stained face and his wild grey elfin locks were dank and heavy with the foul fumes of that black hole of his yet he stopped not to look to left or to right but still kept at it unmindful of aught else hammer 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 
and sigh 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 with a fine inspired smile of misty heroic pleasure about his mouth and the light of prophecy and quenchless courage in his eyes it was very strange to watch him and there was something about the unbroken rhythm of his blows and the inflexible determination hanging about him that held me spellbound waiting i knew not for what but half thinking to witness that red iron wherein to his soul was being welded spring into something wild and strange and fair half thinking to witness these sooty walls fall back into the wide arcades of shadowy realm and that old magician blossom out of his vile rags into some splendid flower of human kind it was foolish but it was an unlearned age and i only a rough soldier that fair maid by my side more familiar with these strange sights and sounds roused me from my expectant watching in a minute she had come in after me had paused as i did and now with pretty filial pity in her face and outspread hands she ran to that old man and laid a tender finger upon his yellow arm and stayed its measured labour at this he looked up for the first time since we entered as dazed and sleepy as one newly waked and seeing that he scarce knew her elizabeth shook her head at him and took his grizzled cheeks between her rosy palms and kissed him first on one side and then on the other kissed him sweet and tenderly upon his pallid unwashed cheeks and then with a kind imperiousness loosed his cramped fingers from the hammer shaft and threw it away and led him by gentle force back from his forge and anvil oh father she said bustling round him and fastening up his shirts and pulling down his sleeves and looking in his face with real solicitude indeed i do think you are the worst father that ever any maid did have and here was another kiss oh how long have you worked down here two nights and days on end fie for shame and how much have you eaten what nothing nothing all that time did ever child have such a parent oh would to heaven you had less wisdom and more wit why if you go on like this you will be thinner than any of these spiders overhead in springtime and weary nay do not tell me you are not and oh so dirty alack that i should let a stranger see thee like this and taking her own white kerchief from her apron that damsel wiped her father's face in love and gentleness and stroked his gritty beard and smoothed as well as she was able his ancient locks then took him by the hand and pointed to me standing a little way off in the gloom at first the old man gazed at the amber-suited gallant shining in the blackness of his workshop stolidly without a trace of recognition but when in a minute or two by an effort he drew his wits together he took me for one of those gay fellows who no doubt had haunted his courtyards and spent his money in brighter times and taxed me with it but i laughed at that and shook my head whereon he mused what art thou then young john eldred of bewley come to pay those twenty crowns your father borrowed twelve years since no i was not john eldred and there were no crowns in my wallet then i must be lord fosdean's reeve come to complain again of broken fences and cattle straying or perhaps a bailiff for the queen's dues and if that were so it was little i would get from him thereon his daughter burst out laughing and stroking the old man's hand oh father she said gently you are not always thus forgetful this excellent gentleman i found trespassing among my flowers and did arrest him he is your guest and declares you brought him here two nights since lodging him in our empty front where he has subsisted all this time on melancholy and stolen meals surely father you recall him now the old man was puzzled but slowly a ray of recollection pierced through the thick mists of forgetfulness indeed he did remember he muttered something of the kind but it was a sturdy shrewd-looking yeoman tall and bronzed under his wide cap a rustic fellow in country cloth that he had brought along and not this yellow gentleman so then i explained how he had resuited me and jogged his memory gently lifting it down the trail of our brief acquaintance as a good huntsman lifts a hound over a cold scent 
until at last when we had given him a cup of red wine from his cupboard in the niche his eyes brightened up the vacuity faded from his face and laughing in turn he knew me then holding out two withered hands in very courteous wise old andrew faulkner welcomed me and in civil courtly speech that seemed strange enough in that grim hole and from that grisly bent unwashed old fellow made apology for the neglect and seeming slight which he feared i must have suffered we spoke together for some minutes and then i ventured to ask was there not something master faulkner you had to tell or ask of me i do remember you mentioned such a wish that evening when we parted and certain circumstances of our short friendship make me curious to know what service it is i have to pay you in return for the hospitality your goodness put upon me in truth there was something faulkner answered with a show of embarrassment but it was a service better sort of frieze than silk tell it good sir tell it it were detestable did silk repudiate the debts that honest frieze incurred why then i will and chance your displeasure sweet bess get thee out and say to dinner this gentleman will dine with me to-day and as mistress elizabeth picked up her pretty skirts and vanished up the grass-grown steps the old recluse turned to me End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the wonderful adventures of fra the phoenician by edwin lester arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain now look you here sir the old philosopher began taking me by a tassel on my satin doublet and working himself up until his eyes shone with pleasure as he unfolded his mad visions to me look you here sir this bare and dingy dungeon that you rightly frown at is a cell more pregnant with ingenuity than ever was the forge of the lame smith of lemnos vulcan vulcan never had such teeming fancies as i have harboured in my head for twenty years vulcan never coaxed into being such a lovely monster as i have hidden yonder i tell you young man gasped the old fellow perspiring with enthusiasm prometheus was a tawdry charlatan his service to mankind compared with what i will be he gave us fire crude rough unruly fire unstable dangerous a bare naked gift spoilt even in the giving by incompleteness but i sir i have tamed what the bold son of clymene only touched ay by the blessed gods i think i have tamed it fire and water i have wed them at yon black altar deadly foes though some do call them i have made them work together the one with the other oh sir such servants were never yet enlisted by our kind since the great day of cyclops and to think those feeble shaking hands whose poor sinews stand from the wasted flesh like ivy strands about a winter tree have done it and this poor head has thought it persistent and at last successful through bitter months of toil and anguish disappointment but sir i said gently as the old man checked his incoherent speech for breath this monster sir this lovely monster what is it ah i was forgetting you did not know look then and though you had been unfamous all your other life this moment of precedent knowledge above your fellows shall make you for ever famous and the old man like a devotee walking to a shrine like a lover with a hushed breath and brightly kindling eye stealing to his mistress's hiding-place led me up to a cavernous recess near the forge and there lay hands upon a rent and tattered drapery of rough sailcloth stained and old and making a gesture of silence pulled it back in the dim weird enchantment of that place i had been prepared for anything it was a nightly fashion of the times to be credulous and that black cobweb den that mad philosopher so eloquently raving and all the late circumstance of my arrival fitted me to look for wonders i had followed him across the grimy floor pitted with grey pools of furnace water through the reek and twining strands of smoke that filled that nether hall and lastly 
when he laid a finger to his lip and so reverent and awful drew back that ancient tattered screen i frowned a little stepping back a pace and drew my ready sword six inches from its scabbard and watched expectant to see some hideous horrid living form chained there some foul offspring of darkness and accursed ingenuity some hateful spawn of wizard art and black mother night some squat foul misshapen caliban some loathsome thing i scarce knew what but strong and sullen and monstrous for certain and instead the screen ran rattling back and there before me in a neat swept space and on a platform of oaken planks glossy in new forged metal shiny with untarnished filings gleaming in the pride of burnished brass and rivets high bulby complicated a maze of pistons and levers and wheels was a great machine somehow as i saw that ponderous monster so full of cunning although so lifeless a tremor of wondering appreciation ran through my mind that soulless body fascinated me with a prophetic fear and awe which at another time and in another place i should have laughed at i put back my sword smiling to think it had been so nearly drawn but yet stood expectant half wondering half hoping i knew not what and gazing raptly on that mighty iron carcass perched there like some black incubus almost fancying all the love and fear and hope that had gone to fashion its steel limbs or iron sinews might indeed have filled it with a soul that should as i looked become articulate and manifest beneath my eyes half hoping in my ignorance that indeed the quintessence of human labour here consummate might have got on all that plastic dull material some wondrous firstling spirit of a new estate some link between the worlds of substance and of shadow and if it so fascinated me that old man to whom it owed its being was even more enthralled he stood before the shrine with locked hands and bent head apostrophizing the silent work oh child of infinitely painful conception he muttered surely surely you cannot disappoint me now near twenty years have i given to you twenty years of toil and sweat and ungrudging hope long hot summers have i worked upon you and dank dull winters making and unmaking building and taking down again contriving hoping despairing living with you day by day and dreaming of you through nights of fitful slumber surely dear heir of all my hopes the reward is at hand the consummation comes see he cried how perfect it is here in this great round cylinder is room for fire and water the fire lies all along in that gully trench that you can note here through this open trap and those curling pipes take the hot flame up through that void that will be filled with the other elements now when water boils the vapour that comes off from the top is choleric and fiery past conception this has been known for long and john homersham tried to utilise it by letting the vapour on the spread digits of a wheel farinelli of angouleme suffered it to escape behind his engine both ways so wasteful that no mortal furnace could keep up power sufficient to be of useful service but i have bettered these and many others nothing is wasted here the hot gases are stored and stocked as they rise above the boiling liquid until they are as strong as the blustering sun of astrius and aurora and then by turning one single tap i suffer them to escape down yonder iron way there to fall upon the head of that piston that with a mighty send gives before them and spins the great wheel above and comes back on the impetus and takes another buffet from the labouring vapour and back it goes again now this way and now that twirling with fiery zeal those notched wheels above and working all those bars and rods and pistons not one thing of all this complicated structure but has its purpose not one rivet in yonder thousands but means a month of patient toilsome thought and labour moreover because it is so strong and heavy i have put the whole upon that iron carriage which took me a year to forge and those solid back wheels are locked with the gear above and from the axle of that front wheel two chains run up and turn upon a cylinder so that my sweet one can move at such pace as yet i cannot even think of 
and guide himself in brief is born and consummate then presently he turned from babbling to his child and speaking louder with frenzied gestures the while he strode up and down before it went wild upon the wondrous things it should do it will not fail i know it my head is fairly mazed when i forecast all that here with this begins as possible it shall run sir he cried turning rapturously to me and fly and walk and haul and pull and hew wood and draw water and be a giant stronger than a thousand men and a craftsman in a hundred crafts of such subtlety and gentleness and cunning as no other master craftsman ever was down into ages not formed in the void womb of the future this knowledge i have mastered shall extend widening as it goes and men shall no longer strive or suffer there stands the patient beast on whose broad back another age shall put all its burdens there is the true winged horse of some other time that shall mock the slow patter of our laggard feet and knit together the most distant corners of the world within its giant stride oh i can see a happy age when base material labour shall be over and men shall lie about and take their fill of restfulness as they have not done since the gates of eden were shut upon their ancient father's back i do see down the long perspectives of the future such as yon achieving all things by both sea and shore ploughing their fields for unborn peoples and drawing nets carrying fetching far and near swift patient indomitable ah and winging glorious argosies mighty vessels such as no man dares dream of now vast noble bodies inspirited each with such a soul as lies impatient yonder and those shall plough the green sea waves in scorn of storm and weather pouring the wealth of far cathay and ind into our ready lap making those things happy necessaries which now none but some few may dare to hope for bringing the spice the persian picked this morning to our doors to-morrow bringing the grape and olive unwithered on their stems bringing the fair eastern stuff still wet from out their divats jove old man that moves me i was a merchant once your words do stir my blood down to the most stagnant corner of my veins bringing pearls from oman still speckled with the green sea-dew upon them and sapphires from rugged ural mines still smelling of their native mother earth bringing in swift tireless keels novaya zemblian furs and costly feathered trophies from the south bringing biafra's hordes of ivory and benin stores of blood-red gold bringing gems warm from tepid sands of arakan and sandalwood from sea-girt nicobar ah pouring the yellow-scented corn of every fertile flat from manfalu to ancient abbasia pouring the tartars millet and the hindus rice into our hungry western mouths making those rich who were once poor and those noble who were only rich benefiting both great and little benefiting both near and far and i shall have done this i poor master andrew faulkner a man so shabby and so seeming mean no one of worth or quality would walk at the same side of the road with him so spoke that good fanatic and as he stopped there came a gentle tap upon the door and a fair face in the sunlight and there was mistress elizabeth saying with a merry laugh father the cloth is laid and the meal is spread and old marjorie bids me add that if to-day's roast is spoiled by waiting as the last one was she'll never cook capon for thee again and coming down the maid laid a hand of gentle insistence upon her father's sleeve and led him sighing and often looking back up the green stone steps i following close behind we crossed the sunny courtyard entering on the farther side the other rambling buttress wing of that ancient pile thence we went by clean white flagstoned passages and open oaken doorways to what was once the long servants dining hall at the near end of the middle table of well scrubbed boards so thick and heavy they might have come from the side of some great ship a clean white slip cloth was laid with high backed chairs one at the head for adam faulkner and two on either side for me and her and lower down again were put below the great oaken salt cellar to other places by one of these stood dame marjorie 
fair elizabeth's old nurse an ancient dame in black velvet cap and spotless ruff and linen with a comely honest old country face above them wrinkled and coloured like a rosy pippin that has mellowed through the winter on a kitchen cornice shelf such was dame marjorie and while she curtsied low and with folded hands i bowed as one of my quality might bow in respect to her ancient faithfulness at the other chair stood their spanish steward black emmanuel barsena yes and as you may by this time have guessed that steward was in flesh and blood none other but the midnight visitor who had disturbed my rest the night before i could not doubt it he wore the same clothes his swarthy sullen face was only a little more lifelike now in the daylight and if more evidence were wanting one finger of his left hand that hand that had held the bloody handkerchief was done up with cobwebs and linen threads i knew him on the instant and stopped and stared to see my vagrant shadow so prosaically standing there at his dinner-place picking his yellow teeth and sniffing the ready roast like a hungry dog and when he saw me he too started for i also had been dreadful to him i was the exact counterpart of that amber gallant that had strode out upon his moonlit heels and scared him with a shout where no doubt he fancied no shouters dwelt and now here we were face to face guests at the same table surely it was strange enough to make us stare but over and above the prejudice of our evening meeting i already distrusted and disliked emmanuel marsena why it was i do not know but so much is certain if one may love no less surely one may hate at first sight and as our eyes met hatred was surely born in his while mine as like as not told through their steady stare of aversion and dislike he was a sullen yellow fellow lean and tall with black crafty eyes set near together a thin nose shaped like a vulture's beak a small peaked beard and black hair closely cropped a crafty cunning cruel ungenerous looking fellow who had somehow it afterwards turned out grown rich as his master's fortunes failed he had come into faulkner's service when a boy had flourished while he flourished and learnt a hundred shifts of cruelty and pride from the gay company who once were proud to call his master comrade and now like the black fungus that he was had swelled with conceit and avarice past all conscionable proportions well we exchanged grim salutations and sat and the meal commenced but all the while we ate and talked i could not help turning to that crafty steward and each time i did so i found his keen restless black eyes wandering fugitive about among us now he would glance at me over his porringer and then a half unconscious scowl dropped down over those dark cordovian brows then perhaps it was the old man he looked at and a scarce hid smile of contempt played about the corners of that southern's mouth to hear his master babble or answer our talk at random lastly my sleek iberian would set his glance on sweet country bess as she sat at her father's side and then there burnt under his yellow skin such a flush of passion such a shine of sickly love and aspiration as needed no interpreting and made me frown small as my stake was in that game i saw was playing as black as inky night but what did it matter to me who picked that english blossom why should she not lie on that mean spanish bosom for ever if she would twas less than nothing to me who would so soon pass on to other ventures and yet no man was ever born who was not jealous and remembering how we had met how sweet she was and simple what native courtesy gilded her country manners what music there was in her voice and how black that villain looked beside her i in spite of myself resented the first knowledge of the love he bore as keenly as though i had myself a right to her pious sanctimonious emmanuel marsena he stood up saying his grace for meat long after all of us were seated and crossed his doublet a score of times ere he fell on the viands like a hungry pike and he was cruel too a little thing may show how big things go he caught a fly while we waited between two courses and thinking himself unwatched held it a moment nicely between his lean long fingers then drawing a straight fine pin from his sleeve slowly thrust it through the body of that buzzing thing 
he stuck the pin up before him by his pewter mug and watched with lowering pleasure his victim gyrate that amused him much and when the creature's pain was reduced to numbness he neatly tore one prismatic wing from off its shoulder and smiled a sour smile to watch how that awoke it then presently the other wing was wrenched palpitating from the damp and quivering socket and the victim spun around under the iron stake that pierced its body and all this under cover of his dinner mug ingenious light-fingered emmanuel marcena such was the steward of that curious household over against him sat the excellent old country dame whose mind wandered no further than to speculate upon the price of eggs next market day or how her bleaching linen fared above was the wise mad scholar bent and visionary and by him ruddy in her country beauty that wild hedgerows of his and as i looked from one to other and thought of what i was and had been all seemed strange unreal fantastic and i could only wait with dull patience for what fortune might have next in store it was a pleasant peaceful place that manor hall when we had finished our midday meal and the servitors had gone to their duties master faulkner said a walk in the green fields might do him good he would go out and take the country air it was a wise resolve and he made a show of carrying it through but he had not crossed the courtyard towards the sunny meadows when he got a sniff of his own smouldering furnace fires that was too much for him the scholar's rustic resolution melted and glancing fugitively behind we saw him presently steal away towards his cellar and then drop down the stairs and bar the door and soon the curling smoke and dancing sparks told that wondrous thing of his was growing once again thus i and the maid were left alone and for a little space we stood silent by the diamond latticed window scarce knowing what to say i looking down upon that virgin bosom so smoothly heaving under its veil of country lawn she thinking i know not what but pulling a leaf or two to pieces from her window vine and so we stood for a time until the lady broke the silence by asking if i would wish to see the house and gardens with her it was a good suggestion and a comely guide so we set out at once she led me first back through her garden again naming every flower and bush by country names as we went along and this brought us to the empty house front which we entered she took me from room to room and dusty corridor to corridor chatting and laughing all the way talking of great kinsmen and noble fickle guests who once had called her father friend all with such a light contented heart it sounded more like fairy story than stern material fact then that tripping guide showed me the one door i had not found which led through into the rearward house here again i told her of how i had hunted in vain for such a passage and she laughed until those ancient corridors resounded to her glee the door admitted to another region which we entered and soon elizabeth had led on down a dusty flight of twilight wooden stairs until a portal studded with iron barred our way at this putting a finger to her mouth in mysterious manner the damsel asked if i dared enter to which my answer was that with sword in hand and her to watch i would not hesitate to prize the gates of hell so we pulled the heavy sullen bolts and the door turned slowly on its hinges there before us was displayed a long dusty corridor lit by high narrow cobwebbed lattice windows down one side and dim with moss and stain of wind and weather from end to end of that soundless vestibule were stacked and piled and hung such mighty stores of various lumber rare curious dreadful as never surely were brought together before it was andrew faulkner's museum room the place where he put by all the strange shreds of life and death he collected when the scholar's fervour was upon him and now as his sweet daughter laid one finger on my arm and softly bid me listen directly down below and under us we heard him hammering at his forge oh sir began that maid whispering in my ear and sweeping her expressive arm round in the direction of those mounds and shelves did ever child have such a father this is the one room that is forbidden me 
and it is the one room of our hundreds that i take a most fearful pleasure in i do wrong to show it and indeed i had not brought you here but that something tells me you are good comrade true and silent both in great and little therefore step lightly and speak small there is nothing in all the world that stirs my father's collar but this to hear a vagrant foot overhead among his treasures softly therefore as any midnight thieves we trod the dust-carpeted floor and now here now there the damsel led me now it was at one oriel recess where stood a black oak table and open chess piled with vellum books all clasped and bound with golden iron that we paused and i opened some of those great tomes and read in norman latin or old frankish french the misty record of those things long ago that once had been so new to me i spelt out how the monkish scribe was stumbling through a passage of that diary that i had seen caesar write saw him repeat as visionary and incredible in quaint and crabbed cloister scrawl the story of the saxon coming and how king harold died i turned to another book a little newer and read mid gorgeous unctuals the story of that remote fight above crecy when good king edward with a scanty band of liegemen was matched against two hundred thousand french about the ville of crecy and by the grace of god withstood them upon an august day and i could have read on and on without stop or pause down those musty memory-rousing pages but for the gentle interrupter at my side who laughed to see me so engrossed and shut the covers too little knowing of the thoughts that i was thinking and took me on again then she would halt at a pile of splendid stuffs half heaped upon the floor half nailed against the wall the hangings of courtly rooms and thrones and as her sympathetic female fingers spread out the folds of all those ruined webs i read again upon them in tarnished golden filigree in silken stitching and patient cunning embroidery more stories of old kings and queens i once was comrade to on again to piles and racks of weapons of every age and time all these i knew and poised the javelin some saxon hand had borne in war and shook like a dry reed the long norman spear and whirled a rusty pirate scimitar above my head until it hummed again an old forgotten tune of blood and lust and pillage and with a stifled shriek the frightened girl cowered from me oh a very curious treasure-house indeed and here the scholar had laid up skins and furs of animals and there horns and hoofs and talons here grim melancholy great birds were standing as though in life and crumbling as they waited with neglect and age there in a twilight corner glimmered the green glassy eyes of an old thebian crocodile and there the shining ivory jaws of monstrous fishes with warty hides of toads and shrivelled forms of small beasts dried in the kiln of long silent ages and now black shrunken and ghastly on the walls were pendant enough simples and electrices to stock twenty witches dens enough mandrake hellebore blue monk's hood purple tinted nightshade to unpeople half a shire and along by them were withered twigs and leaves would banish every kind of room samples of wondrous shrubs and roots all neatly docketed would cure a wife of scolding or a war-horse of a sprain would cure an adder's bite or by the same physic mend a broken limb ah and bring you certain luck in peace and war or light all out of the same virtue the fires of love in icy virgin bosoms in that quaint anteroom dimly illumined by its cobwebbed windows were astrolabes and hemispheres from the cabin poops of sunken merchantmen charts whereon great beasts shared with pictured savages whole continents of land and dolphins and whales did sport where seas ran out into unknown vagueness there were models of harmless things of foreign art and commerce and cruel iron jaws and wheels with bloody spikes or beaks for breaking bones or tearing flesh and teaching the ways of fair civility to heretics that old man had got together twenty images of baal from as many lands and half a hundred bits of diverse saints here tied with the strand of the rope that hanged him was the skin of a dead felon and near 
was the true shirt of a martyr whom the church had canonised a thousand years before in some way too the scholar had possessed him of a pharaoh still swaddled with his memphian robes and there he was propped up against the wall that kingly ash with mouth locked tight whose lightest whisper once had made or marred in every court or camp from dusty ababda to green euphrates and brows set rigid whose frown had once cost twenty thousand lives made twenty thousand wives to widows and eyes shut fast that seemed to dream of shadowy empery of golden afternoons in golden ages a most ancient a most curious fellow and i stared hard at him feeling wondrous neighbourly but i cannot tell all there was in that strange place from end to end it was stocked with learned lumber from end to end my sweet guide led me pointing whispering and shuddering all on tiptoe and in silence and then ere i was nearly satisfied or had sampled one quarter of that dusty treasure hall she led me through a little wicket down twenty stairs and so once more into the fresh open air there sir she said now have i laid bare my father's riches to you is it not a wonderful corridor oh what a full place the world must be if one man can gather so much strange of it i told her that indeed it was and had been full right back into the illimitable of those hopes and fancies to which all yonder shreds did hint of and thus talking i of infinite experience watching the sweet wonder and vague speculation dawning in those unruffled child eyes of hers we sauntered about the gardens and pleasant paths and spent a sunny afternoon in her ambient fields End of chapter twenty one